cardiac cycle. Question. So, uh, doesn't the cardiac cycle sound like something you work out on at the gym? Yeah, I get on the cardiac cycle. I work out about 30 minutes every day. No. What we want to do here with the cardiac cycle is to talk about the changes that are occurring in the heart each time the heart goes through contraction and relaxation. Before we start into this, I, I don't want you to get yourself so buried in the detail that you forget that you already know what's occurring here. So let's look again, think about what's occurring, and then we're gonna look at the details. So you know that blood's gonna come in, right, either from the pulmonary veins or the superior inferior vena cava, enter those atria, move into the ventricles, when the ventricles contract, the, the AV valves will close, so the pressure builds in the ventricles, right? It will then push the blood up and out into the, let's just do the aorta, opening the semilunar valve, pushing the blood out into the aorta, and then when the pressure de begins to decrease in the ventricles, the aortic pressure will exceed what's in the ventricles, and those semilunar valves catch, right? They, they fill, they close to stop the backflow. So you know this cycle but we're just gonna look at the detail of it to think about how these things are all coordinated. All right, so uh, again, the term systole means contraction, diastole means relaxation. If people don't add atria, they just say systole and diastole, they're talking about the ventricles. But we can, we can add atria and, and, and uh, ventricles to our, our terms. So let's take a look at this cardiac cycle. And so there's a ton of information that, that's, that's on this one little diagram. It's showing diastole, it's showing systole, and I want you to think about this as being a circle. So I actually have in my office, I forgot to bring today, a toilet paper roll that I have this cycle on so that you can just turn it around and you see that, that this end connects to this end, right? So it's just a cycle. So let's pick this up in early diastole. Okay, so we're going to begin our cycle, our discussion in early diastole of the, the ventricles. So here we are in diastole, the, the ventricles are at rest, and let's take a look at that left ventricular volume. And you can see that the volume is filling very, very rapidly in early diastole. So blood is filling in there quickly. Of course, it's coming through the, the mitral valve, the AV valve that's above the left ventricle. This is for the, the left side. Right side's pretty much just the same. All right, so the, the AV valve has to be open. We can see it there. It says mitral valve is open, right? So the ventricle is filling very, very quickly. We'll find that that's important to us later, uh, that it's a rapid filling. Right, so we're filling, 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 and of course pressure in the atria has to be greater than pressure in the ventricle in order to get the ventricle to fill. If we look way up here on the ECG, nothing's happening on the ECG, and then all of a sudden as we move into late diastole, we're going to get the P wave. And so as we move into late diastole, the P wave's going to occur, and we know what the P wave represents. It represents depolarization of the atria. And so here's a surprise, it was to me anyway the first time I learned this, is there's depolarization of the atria, of course, so the next thing that we expect is that the atria will contract. And we can actually see that the atria contract because look at this last little surge that occurs in ventricular volume. So all of this rapid filling that occurred, occurred before the atria ever contracted. 80% of the filling of the ventricles occurs without the atria contracting. That is, there's enough pressure in the system from the last beat to cause blood to pass right through the atria into the ventricles and cause the ventricles to fill, about 80%. Okay. Then we have that P wave, and now we have contraction of the, vent of the atria and the last little topping off of the ventricles. The blood that's left in the ventricles at the end of diastole has been cleverly named. They call it the end diastolic volume. 
Makes perfect sense, right? So the volume of blood that's in there is the end diastolic volume. I'm having trouble with my pointer. Not a good day to have trouble with the pointer. My battery's fading. I'll have to use my other. Okay, so here we are. We come back over here to this other side. You can see this is just a continuation. It's the same as this, right? Nothing different. It's the same. And now we're going to start to have the excitement occurring. Just as we come to the end of diastole, the QRS complex is going to begin. We know what that means. Depolarization of the ventricles. So if the ventricles start to depolarize, the next thing that they're going to do is they will contract. And so we're going to start systole of the ventricles. So here we go, systole of the ventricles. As the ventricles start to contract, of course, the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the atria. And so we can see that the mitral valve is going to close to stop backflow into the atria. So ventricular pressure exceeds atrial pressure. The pressure is building, building, building. As the ventricles are contracting, this pressure is building. And now the pressure is greater in the ventricles than in the aorta. So what's going to happen? The aortic semilunar valve will open. Right? Because the pressure was greater from below than it was in the aorta. And so once that aortic semilunar valve opens, look what's going to happen to the volume in the ventricles. It's dropping, dropping, dropping. Where's the blood going? Into the aorta, going up, right? Into the aorta. So it's going out, right? We're pushing the blood out, 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 out. And now as we come to the end of systole, we're going to call the volume that's left in the ventricle the end systolic volume. Okay? So the volume that's left in there is the end systolic volume. And of course, as we come to the end of systole, the pressure in the aorta will exceed the pressure in the ventricles. And so the aortic semilunar valve will close. And now the ventricular pressure is dropping, 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 dropping. It's lower than what's in the atria, and so the mitral valve will open, and we're going to start the process again. The amount of blood that gets pumped out, the, the, what went out of the heart, is called the stroke volume, and we can write a little easy equation here. We can say that the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume equals the stroke volume. Huh? So the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume is equal to the stroke volume. Okay, my pointer is not working too well. But I have to say, when I first learned this, I was surprised to learn that only about half the blood that's in the ventricle is pushed out during each contraction. So if you look, right, they're showing this in diastolic volume of about 130, and look at the in systolic volume, about 65. So in each beat of the heart, only about half the blood is pushed out. Now, during hard work, we can dramatically change that. We can cause a lot more of that blood to be pushed out. We can lower that in systolic volume. But at rest right now, you're only pumping out about half the blood each time that the, the heart contracts. The pulmonary circuit works the same as this uh, systemic circuit at a lower pressure. Okay? But it's the same cycle. Lower pressure, but the same cycle. So uh, lots of information there. It's going to take you a while to digest it. Right? You're going to have to spend a bit of time trying to think about all that, that stuff. That was, that brings us to cardiac output. Okay. The cardiac output. Cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood pumped by one ventricle in one minute. Okay. Cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood pumped by one ventricle in one minute. We can write a very simple equation for cardiac output. We can say that cardiac output, 
Q, which means a, a flow. Engineers use that as, as a flow. So Q, or cardiac output, is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. Okay? So cardiac output is heart rate times the stroke volume. And it's not a hard calculation, right? So if we knew, for us, that a person's heart rate was 80 beats per minute, and their stroke volume, let's say that they were pumping out 60 mils per beat, beats canceled, we'll end up with mils per minute, and what's our cardiac output? 60 times 80, 4,800. 4,800 mils per minute. That's actually a pretty average cardiac output. On average, our cardiac outputs at rest are about five liters per minute. That's a, a pretty average cardiac output. Um, when we talk about blood, I, I didn't really talk about your total blood volume, but it turns out you have about five liters of blood in your body. You have about five liters of blood in your body. So I'm gonna ask you a trick question now, and I'm telling you ahead of time it's a trick question. Average cardiac output, five liters per minute. Average blood volume, five liters. How long does it take for the blood to go from the time it leaves the heart to come back to the heart? What do you think? All right, five liters of blood per minute. We have five liters. So wouldn't the obvious answer be about one minute? Right, you got five liters that you're pumping each minute, and you got five liters of blood. So you would think, nobody answered that. That would seem like the easy answer. You would think that it would take about one minute to do the cycle. However, I told you it was a trick question because I defined cardiac output at the beginning as the amount of blood pumped by one ventricle in one minute. We have two ventricles pumping, all right? So if we compare the blood, amount of blood pumped from the left ventricle per minute to the amount of blood pumped by the right ventricle per minute, what do you think? Greater, lesser, equal? I didn't hear a good answer there anywhere, but uh, where does the left ventricle get its blood from? From the lungs, where does the lungs get its blood from? The right ventricle, right? The right ventricle supplies the lungs, so the right ventricle supplies the left ventricle. Where does the right ventricle get its blood from? The left ventricle. So they better be pumping the same amount of blood each minute or one end or the other is going to run out, right? On average, they better be pumping the same or you're going to run out. So now, how long does it take for a blood cell to do its average route before it comes back to the heart? About 30 seconds, right? Because you're actually pumping 10 liters a minute. Now, in the pulmonary circuit, it's much shorter. In the systemic circuit, much longer. But isn't that amazing? Right? You're actually pumping with two ventricles about 10 liters a minute of cardiac output. Okay, enough of these math questions, right? So uh, we can change either our heart rate or our stroke volume, right? So either our heart rate or stroke volume can change to change our cardiac output. Right now, you're pumping about five liters per minute. If a tiger was chasing you, you need to pump a lot more than five liters per minute. During very stressful exercise, your cardiac output can rise up to 25, up to 35 liters per minute. Huge, right? You need a lot more output. So we can change either the stroke volume or the heart rate. And so I put, as I try to kind of get us thinking, it's hard to tell what they're doing here, but this is supposed to be one person helping another person bail out their boat. Okay? So we all decide it's time for a field trip down to the wharf. We go down there, somebody's bailing out the boat, right? And I say to you, I wonder how fast they're bailing the water out of their boat in, in mils per minute. 
What are the two pieces of information that you'd need to know? Input. Well, input, output, no, but I mean, what, what are the two? We're watching. They got a can. They're going. Oh, yeah. How much water they're taking? What's the volume of the can? We need to know that. And what else do you need to know? How fast are they doing it? And we can figure out mils per minute that they're pumping out. Same thing for us, right? Cardiac output, mils per minute. If we know the stroke volume and you know the heart rate, we can calculate the cardiac output. And either of those, the person's bailing the boat, they could go faster or they could get a bigger bucket or a smaller bucket, right? So they can change the size of the can that, that they're using. Well, we are able to do the same thing. So let's look at control of heart rate. A little irritating there. Control of heart rate. We say that changes in, in heart rate are chronotropic changes. I'm wearing a chronograph today. Not many people wear chronographs anymore. What's a chronograph? A watch. A watch, right? I'm surprised how few people wear chronographs, right? Everybody gets their time off of their phones these days. So something that had a negative chronotropic effect on the heart would do what to the heart rate? Slow it down, positive, speed it up. Sympathetic nervous system, what do you think? Positive chronotropic. Parasympathetic. Negative chronotropic. Epinephrine. Positive. Acetylcholine. Negative. Right? Remember acetylcholine is the end part that's coming out of the parasympathetic. So, uh, Changes in heart rate are referred to as, as chronotropic effects. Sympathetic can speed it, parasympathetic can slow it. So even though the heart has its own built-in rhythm, there are nerves that go to the SA node and we can speed or slow, right? Positive or negative chronotropic effects on the heart. Let's look at control of stroke volume. Things that change stroke volume are called inotropic effects. Ino means fiber. Remember, troph means to feed or nourish, right? So chronotropic, time feeding, inotropic, fiber feeding. So if something makes the heart contract more strongly, we say it has a positive inotropic effect. More, if it makes it slow down, a negative inotropic effect. Surprisingly, I don't think it's not surprising to you, your heart can change its stroke volume, right? So it can go bigger, it can go smaller, depending upon our needs. The stroke volume, as I told you a minute ago, is equal to the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. And so if you think about that for a minute, hopefully it occurs to you that we can change either the end diastolic volume or the end systolic volume to change the stroke volume. One of the mechanisms that we have available is something called an intrinsic control mechanism, huh? an intrinsic control mechanism. And this really has to do with something that we call Starling's Law of the Heart. There were actually two researchers that were involved in discovering this, a man named Frank and a, a man named Starling. So you'll sometimes hear it called by really what they should call it, the Frank-Starling Law of the Heart. But commonly, people just say the Starling's Law of the Heart. So Starling's law of the heart says that the heart will pump all of the blood that comes to it. Huh? Starling's law says the heart will pump all of the blood that comes to it. What the heck does that mean? It'll pump all the blood that comes to it. During an emergency, your veins constrict, your spleen contracts. And all of that pushes more blood to the heart. When that excess blood shows up at the ventricles, the ventricles stretch. And we know from when we talked about skeletal muscle that if you stretch the, car the skeletal muscle, we got stronger contractions within some range, right? The same thing happens with cardiac muscle. If you stretch that muscle, it contracts more strongly and delivers more blood out. So in Starling's law, the more blood that comes to the heart, the more stretch you get, the stronger the contraction. And it turns out cardiac muscle tissue can undergo a great deal of stretch before you start to get the drop off that we saw like in skeletal muscle. Huh? 
So more blood returning, stronger contraction. We call this an intrinsic mechanism because the heart's kind of generating it by itself, by it is being stretched. So contraction of the vena cavi, or of the, excuse me, the vessels, uh, contraction of the spleen, bringing more blood back through the vena cavi, and through the, you're also gonna end up more blood coming into the, the uh, left ventricle as well. You stretch the muscle, stronger contractions. Another intrinsic mechanism besides sympathetic stimulation of the veins is that in taking deeper breaths, not as, not as uh, big an effect as the sympathetic nervous system's having, but in taking deeper breaths, you expand that chest, and as you expand your chest, you're actually pulling on the great veins, on the vena cavi, and that tends to pull more blood into the heart. You're also pulling on the heart. And so that will increase the contraction of the heart as well, taking deeper breaths. Pulling on the veins brings more blood. Pulling on the heart brings more blood. These are intrinsic mechanisms. Extrinsic control. <laughs> Extrinsic control. The sympathetic nervous system can stimulate the myocardial cells to contract more strongly. We call it extrinsic because it's not coming kind of built in from the muscle. It's coming from outside, sympathetic, right? So the sympathetic nervous system can cause a stronger contraction of the ventricle. It can decrease the in systolic volume. Do you see we really have kind of done two different things? In Starling's law, what did we do? We increased the in diastolic volume. When we look at extrinsic control, the sympathetic nervous system can reduce the in systolic volume. If you reduce the in systolic volume, you've also increased stroke volume. Parasympathetic nervous system has no inotropic effect. Eh? So the parasympathetic does not have an inotropic effect. It does have a chronotropic effect. In addition to the sympathetic nervous system causing stronger contractions of the myocardium, it can cause faster contractions of the myocardium. Now, I, I want to kind of pause here for a minute. So a minute ago, we learned sympathetic can change the chronotropic effects, how fast the heart's contracting. This is different, what I'm telling you now. The actual how long it takes for the cells to contract can be sh shortened by the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so we can do both things, change the, the, the amount of relaxation time, shorten diastole, but we can also decrease the systole time. Let's go back to our cardiac cycle for a minute. So I told you that this rapid filling of the heart was going to become important to us. Right? The fact that during early diastole, we get this rapid filling. <coughs> Let's think about the tiger chasing you and your heart rate having to go up. So does it make sense that as your heart rate goes up, that the time for diastole would decrease? If your heart rate's gonna go up, you're gonna have to decrease the amount of time that your heart's in relaxation, right? You're, slow, you're, you're going faster, 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 so diastole is shrinking. Well, as diastole shrinks, you have less and less time to fill the heart, right? We're shrinking, 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 there's less and less time. If you get the diastole time too short, you don't have enough time to fill the cup before it contracts again. So the guy is bailing out the boat and he starts going, the water's coming in faster and faster. He has a soup can. He's going faster and faster and faster. Can you see at some point, he's not gonna have the can underwater long enough to fill the can to empty it, right? So if you go too fast, the efficiency is lost. If your heart beats too fast, you will lose that efficiency. It occurs at right around 200 beats per minute, okay? Right around 200 beats per minute, you're starting to go so fast that there's not enough time to fill before you empty. 
in addition to losing or, or shortening that diastole time, so we want that rapid fill, right? The rapid fill at the beginning gives us early filling so we can have more, more blood there. But in addition to shortening diastole, the sympathetic nervous system can shorten systole. So we can pick up a little bit by shortening the systole time, making those fibers contract a little faster so that we can actually gain a little bit more there. Well, uh, before we leave this, it's pretty common for athletes to have very slow heart rates. Hopefully you know this from somewhere, right? Some of the uh, professional bicyclists have resting heart rates in the 30s. My brother, the four-time Olympian, still has resting heart rates in the low 40s. Now, if the heart rate is very slow, but they have to pump the same amount of blood, what does that tell you about the stroke volume? Let's go back. Back to the math. Right? Let's say that we have somebody at rest that needs to pump 4,800 mils per minute. Okay, so we know that. That's a given. They need to pump 4,800 mils per minute. What if, instead of having 60 mils per beat that their stroke volume is, what if all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but over time, through practice, we get their stroke volume to go up to 100 mils per beat? What will their resting heart rate now be? 48. 48. Do you see what's happening? Through regular exercise, you increase the efficiency of your heart so that the stroke volume goes up. If the stroke volume goes up, then the resting heart rate can go down. If the upper limit to your ability to push blood through the heart is around 200 beats per minute, and you have a stroke volume of 100 mils, and somebody else only has a stroke volume of 50 mils, who's going to be pumping more blood at the upper limit? The person with the big stroke volume. And at the same work level, they can have their heart working at a slower rate. Again, my brother, a uh, very small man. Right? Even today, he only weighs like 122 pounds. Huh? So when I take his pulse, because he has such a whole high stroke volume, I almost think that I'm going to see him move, kind of like, boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> right? Uh, because they have to have a big stroke volume to have such a slow heart rate. All right, let's stop there. Uh, so Monday we've got a quiz, some, some pretty tough